Hi everyone. We're going to be starting the musculoskeletal system and I'm really excited because this is honestly my favorite system of all time and I know you guys think I say that about all the systems but I really really love musculoskeletal. So before we actually begin I want you to make sure that you have a couple of sticks um, specifically one that's old so you just run outside somewhere and I want you to grab an old stick and I also want you to grab a stick that's new so um, one that's maybe fresh off a tree you know just a little twig or something or one that um, is still pretty green or, or pretty fresh okay and uh, that's the main thing that I want you to have for this lecture so please make sure you have that before you start also um, a reminder make sure that you have done your letter to self that you're going to be turning in to me in person on your final exam week. So this is a letter assignment that is on Sakai and you're actually going to place it in an envelope sealed to yourself and you're going to hand it in to me. Okay, so just make sure you spend some time working on that. In addition, if we were together in person, I would have you do part of the lecture sitting in a wall sit against the wall. So feel free to do that for yourself as well. Now, regarding the bones, um, it's really important that you know the basic structures. So you should know the difference between the epiphysis, um, the epiphyseal line or plate, which is the growth plate. You need to know where those are. You should know the difference between the proximal and the distal epiphysis. So you should be able to kind of run, run your um, <clears throat> pens down the different structures in bones and be able to label them. You don't need to know the name of every single bone in the body because you've already had to do that in an anatomy class, um, but you, you should know the basics, okay? And the importance of that is if you are having an intelligent conversation with someone, a provider with another RN, um, I want you to be able to take a look and understand where a fracture is, where a tumor is, um, why is it worse if, if a child has a fracture on the epiphyseal plate versus, you know, somewhere else in that bone shaft? Um, <clears throat> you should know the difference between the spongy bone and the, um, the compact bone. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so please, please do make sure that you review that uh, while you're working on musculoskeletal this week. Now, question for you, how many bones do we have? And I'm sure many of you are thinking somewhere around 200, right? So we have about 206 bones as adults. But how many bones were we actually born with? We actually were born with 300 bones in our skeleton. So you're probably thinking, well, what happened to all of almost 100 bones, right? And really what happens is we fuse. We have a lot of bones that fuse from birth into um, adulthood. And then we have about 206 bones left. That should be about what we have. What do you think is the largest bone? Hopefully you said the femur, and the femur is correct. Um, along with being the largest bone, does anybody know what actually travels through the femur and why it's so dangerous for us to have a break or some sort of trauma to the femur? Let's say, um, you know, a really bad car accident or a crushing injury to the femur. From your reading, you probably picked up that there's quite a lot of blood vessels that go through the femur. Uh, not just the femur, but bones in general. So if you have a large bone like that, and all of a sudden, let's say, it gets crushed or broken, you now have the risk of bleeding from that site, and losing a lot of blood. So that's important to keep in mind when you're thinking about someone who has a fracture um, a break, you know, a crush injury or something like that. Where do you think the smallest bone of the body is? 
hopefully you considered the ear because there's a bone called the stirrup bone. It's only 2.8 millimeters long and it's in our middle ear. So that's the smallest. And then my last question is, where do you think most bones are found in the body? Where do you think most of them are clumped together? Because these are areas that we're going to see a lot more fractures in, right? A lot more issues. So hands, fingers, and wrists are our biggest culprits. Now you see in front of you a couple different types of cells. <clears throat> Of course, you need to know the difference between them and know their functions. Um, where do you think, which, which cell do you believe would be responsible for causing a bone spur? And some of you may have had bone spurs. Perhaps you've heard of bone spurs. Um, I certainly, my husband has a pretty bad bone spur underneath uh, his foot. And so... Um, if you don't know what it is, it's actually when you run out of enough um, cushioning between bones and the friction that's caused maybe by repetitive sports injuries or the loss of cartilage in a, in a joint causes um, one of these cell types to go a little crazy and it starts forming excess bone in an area that it should not be. So which one do you think that would be? If you're looking at all these, an osteoblast is going to form new bone matrix, okay? On the flip side, an osteoclast is resorbing bone. Resorb is a weird word that you may not have heard prior to this um, system, but resorbing bone means that this cell is actually dissolving or digesting bone, okay? So these guys are working all the time. And they're constantly, throughout your lifetime, forming new bone and taking away new bone and kind of digesting old bone. Okay, Osteocytes fit into mature bone matrix and kind of maintain it. And clearly stem cells are going to create all of the other cells that are differentiated, which you guys know by now. <clears throat> so human bones grow continuously until about our mid-20s. And since our bones are constantly being broken down and rebuilding, it takes about, about every seven years, we essentially have new bone, which is, to me, just fascinating, just unbelievable. And if I asked you, can our bones regrow and repair themselves, what would your answer be? Yes. Okay, we often just splint bones, don't we? We often just allow them to kind of sit near each other, connecting, and that's it. The body does all the rest of the work. It is just so cool. And we'll kind of look at that process in detail in a little bit. Okay. Bone marrow. Has anyone in here eaten bone marrow? Perhaps you've had a, a beef bone marrow or something like that. Um, why is it so important? Why is, why is bone marrow crucial to understanding the musculoskeletal system. Bone marrow actually makes up about 4% of our, our body mass, and it produces all those awesome things that you learned about in the hematology lecture, right? So um, white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, okay? All of the blood cells that are important to us are, are functioning here. They're being born in this bone marrow. Um, so clearly, if you have a cancer of the bone marrow and you have cancer cells taking over that area, all the rest of those cells are in jeopardy. Um, and that's why, you know, cancers of the bone marrow are extremely scary and we consider bone marrow transplants in order to allow the body to survive that. Um, so that's kind of very important for you to understand. There's a lot of nutrients in the bone marrow, and of course there's blood vessels, a lot of blood going through. Okay, now the bone marrow is in the middle, so if you're looking at, if you're just considering a bone and you cross-section it, kind of like this picture, you're, you're kind of seeing a cross-section here. So this bone on the outside, think about what this would be called, the outer part of the bone. So this is going to be 
the, um, <clears throat> the cortical bone, okay, and kind of the stronger bone. It's real thick, it's real heavy, it's very strong. Okay, the bone marrow lies in the middle, and then surrounding the bone marrow is actually another type of bone. Does anyone know what it's called? It's a spongy bone. It's much lighter. Okay, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit as well. So you can kind of see all the importance of the bone marrow, right, and, and why um, we need a lot of blood and nutrients going to that area. It's so that we can create these guys who literally um, upkeep our world, right? Okay, here we go. So now you can see the spongy bone in here. The spongy bone is very porous, okay? And porous is not a bad thing, assuming it's in the right amounts. When you get over porous, that's when we start to talk about osteoporosis. But we're not there yet. We're talking about normal bone. <clears throat> so why don't we just walk around with a whole bunch of really uh, heavy um, cortical bone? Why, why don't we have a bunch of compact cortical bone? And you can see this out here. Okay, so that's the heavy, strong. Why isn't all of our bone just compact bone? Because compact bone makes up about 85% of our skeleton. The spongy bone only makes up about 15%. However, if you kind of can consider what we need to do to survive, okay, and that go back a ways into kind of our um, primal days, okay, what do we need to do? We need to be able to move, right? And we, we walk on two feet. We don't walk on four legs. And we need to move very quickly, okay? So one of the major explanations as to why we have this cancellous bone or spongy bone is because it makes us a lot lighter. It is so much lighter than the compact bone. If our all of our skeleton was 100% compact bone, it would be too heavy practically for our muscles, tendons, and ligaments to move us. Okay. Um, now, when we see patients that are obese, you know, that's extra lipids and, and extra fat. And actually, fat is going to weigh less than having, you know, all compact bone, although it's still a huge impact on our ability to move. Now, there's another reason that we have this spongy bone, and that's going to be to allow blood vessels to go through. So we have a lot of capillaries and a lot of blood vessels and things, okay? And it's very, very important, as you can see, kind of right through here, an example, that where the blood vessels go, okay? So within the spongy bone, there are these plates or bars. They're called trabeculi, which you probably remember learning about in your book. And the spaces in between them have red bone marrow and also the capillaries come through, okay? So a little quiz for you, mature bone is a rigid blank blank consisting of cells, fibers, ground substance, and minerals. So I'm wondering if you guessed it, and the answer is a rigid connective tissue. The fibers of bones are made up of blank, which gives bone its tensile strength. Okay, tensile strength meaning the ability to hold um, itself together, right? And the answer is collagen. Okay, here's the fun part. Take out your sticks. You should have an old stick and you should have a new green stick or a new um, young, fresh stick that just came off the tree. And what I want you to do is I want you to take your stick, take the old one first, and I want you to apply a pressure, a force of some kind. You can twist it, you can, you can crush it, you can snap it, okay? Imagine that stick being your femur. Take the, the green stick, okay? And I want you to do the same thing, okay? And I want you to look at the difference, how they snap. What kind of fracture did you end up with? What kind of force did you push on it? How easy was it for the bone to break or not? Okay, now once you have a fracture, I want you to look at this picture and see if you can figure out what kind of fracture. Now you can decide, does your, your old stick have perhaps a, 
a tumor already in it? Do you see a tumor on there? Do you see some sort of osteoporosis in that stick, perhaps, because it's really old? Okay, in that case, you might have a pathological fracture, meaning there was a disease first and the, the fracture came from very minimal force. Okay, not normally enough force to create a fracture. However, if you had a pretty healthy um, bone and you had a pretty bad force, you could have any of these. Okay. Now, an open fracture is going to mean that the bone has actually um, gone outside of the skin layer, so it's sticking out versus closed means the fracture, you know, most of us have experienced closed fractures. Um, open is much more dangerous for reasons that you can imagine, um, mainly being what? Risk for infection, right? Risk for infection. Every time you open up that skin layer, lots of bad things can come in through and, you know, it's very scary to imagine organisms going straight into the bone, straight into the bone marrow, etc. <clears throat> now, your fresh stick, the green one, how difficult was it to actually even create a fracture? And, and what did you notice when you, when you broke it? Most likely, if you got a fresh green stick, you actually only were getting a break in one side. Okay, that, so if you look at this green stick um, picture here, you'll notice there's a break here, okay, but it's still connected over here. That is so typical of what population? Children. Children have very flexible, malleable, almost, I think they're called soft bones, okay? They do not usually break all the way through um, because they're growing and they're soft. They tend to get this, what's called a green stick fracture. Now, that doesn't mean that you couldn't have an adult with a green stick fracture, but they are much, much more common in children. Okay. Finally, the last thing <clears throat> that I want to mention is that um, there's another thing about children that you want to be aware of. Can anyone think of something that's very different about children's fractures and adult fractures uh, that could greatly affect the child's um, growth and um, performance as they become adults? So hopefully, you thought about the growth plate, okay? Now, if you don't know where the gro growth plate is, you need to go back to your anatomy and find the epiphyseal plates, okay? Those are the growth plates. They're going to be a little different, but you can figure, in, figure them out on all the major bones once you see a few. So every time I have a patient that comes in who's still in a growing stage and, you know, like in urgent care and they are afraid of a fracture, you know, we're always checking, first of all, is there a fracture? Second of all, is it on the growth plate? Okay, if it's on the growth plate, they have to be referred to a specialist who works specifically with making sure the growth plate is repaired. Um, surgery may or may not be needed, but it's much more serious because if we damage the growth plate and don't fix it, the child may not grow on that side of the body appropriately as the other side. Okay, so please do review that. <clears throat> so there's other types of breaks. Um, we talked about pathologic. So stress and fatigue, I don't want you to confuse those. Okay, stress fracture is not a fracture you get from being in nursing school. Okay, but it's more of a fracture that you would get if you were to put the same stress on your body every day doing the same procedure, okay? So you are training for your marathon and you run five to 10 miles just about every day, okay? It's not an immediate thing. It's something that happens on, you know, you know, maybe a month or two into your training from the repeated stress in the same area of the bone. Okay, stress fractures tend to be real thin and more difficult to see. They're, they're difficult to see on an x-ray, but they hurt and your body tells you it's there. Okay, so that's a stress fracture. So that's a repeated strain in the same area. Now, a fatigue fracture is a little different. 
It's actually a fracture that's caused by a new exercise that's done in extremities. So, you know, um, you're used to, you know, working out a decent amount, doing some cardio, going to the gym, doing your thing. Okay. And then you go into and join a group that does excessive amounts of marching, running, and heavy lifting. Okay? So if you can imagine a group of people that would do that, who would be most likely to suffer from a fatigue fracture? Quickly. It comes on much more quickly than a stress one, stress fracture. So new military recruits in boot camp suffer from these types of fractures. Okay, now the other ones you can see my notes on, but those are kind of, I don't want you to get those mixed up. Very interesting though. Okay, this is probably my favorite picture ever because this shows you how amazing our bodies are when it comes to bone healing. So if I were to ask you, in a normal bone remodeling, okay, which is this whole system, is there scar tissue left? Okay, is there... Um, some sort of abnormality that's normally left after a bone heals? The answer is no. Actually, there isn't. Our body resorbs all of the extra scar tissue, um, everything, okay? And we are left with a 100% beautiful new bone. That's a normal, healthy, functioning bone remodeling system. Okay, that means... All we have done is we've taken the fracture and we've aligned it, you know, like you broke your toe, we're going to splint it to your other toe, and it's going to turn out perfect, okay, assuming everything is lined up and you have a healthy functioning body. This is, what, this is what happens on a smaller level. So the first, the break happens, right? You get a hematoma, okay? As you guys know, hematomas are full of blood and other good cells, okay? So that's this big initial part. Notice the blood flow, okay? The break in the vessels is, is part of what causes the hematoma because there's trauma there, okay? All right, and then you get new blood vessels to form, okay? Because the old ones were kind of broken, damaged, traumatized. New ones actually form quite quickly, and you get what's considered an external callus, okay? All right, and then moving on, you get the bony callus formation, okay? So the bony callus of the spongy bone comes out and, and helps, okay? And then anything extra gets reabsorbed and you have the healed, fra uh, the healed fracture eventually. So this is kind of the last phase of the bone remodeling and then all of this goes back to normal. So it's, it's, really, um, it's really unbelievable. There's no new scar tissue. Where else do we see this type of uh, regeneration in the body? Hopefully, you thought of the liver. because The liver is the only other area in the body that does that with no new scar tissue when it heals. Okay. Now, a little bit backwards. So, we were talking about children. We talked about growth plates. We talked about green stick fractures. We also have to talk about something called a torus fracture. Um, and you'll talk about this more in peds. Torus fracture is a buccal fracture. So it's actually very similar thought process to spongy soft bones, okay? Tends to be when kids jump off high things, they get what's called a buccal fracture. And when you look at it on an x-ray, um, it literally just looks out like a little bump in the bone doesn't look like a break okay it's still considered a fracture it's still painful you just have to be very careful about growth plates okay so you can see it here so this is a torus fracture or a buccal fracture very common in children and here's that green stick we talked about also common in children okay so take a look at this uh, this foot Okay, I want you to think about, or you can say out loud, all the manifestations of a bone fracture. 
of any kind. What are you going to see? What do you see here? Deformity. Okay. Maybe perhaps some blood, some swelling. Do you think the patient's going to be able to function the area that has been uh, broken? No. Right? Loss of function of that joint. Pain. Perhaps impaired sensation. Okay. Meaning you touch this toe and it's not going to feel like touching this toe. You can have muscle spasms. You can have heat, right? So you can have all these things. So what's great about this picture is you can literally see what it looks like on the outside and then look at what it looks like on the inside. Okay, so what do you see in here? You actually see this. If you can assume, see these beautiful connecting lines here. And you try to find those over here and you see breaks and jaggedness and darkness and all of that, okay? So there are multiple fragments in here. This is not a clean break. This is not a simple, oh, let's just put these two back together, okay? This is a uh, many, many pieces floating around in here, very small, and this is not going to just easily uh, be splinted and put back together. So what do we do for a break like that? I mean, how do we treat something that doesn't just go back together like that? And by the way, this is my brother's foot <laughs> when he was um, cycling with flip-flops on on a road bike going downhill at very fast speeds. Okay, so what do we do for him? We're actually going to have to do direct healing. So most of the time when you have a fracture, you're dealing with indirect healing. That means we're not, we're not um, surgically, you know, manipulating and reducing the bones back together. We're actually just kind of sort of, you know, splinting it and allowing the body to put it back together. So that's indirect healing. Indirect healing can have a lot of problems um, if it's not done um, appropriately, okay, or if the patient has other issues or the bones aren't aligned. So this is an example of uh, something gone wrong, but normally indirect healing works just fine. Now for my brother's foot, as you can imagine, okay, in here, there are going to have to be screws, okay, surgically placed, multiple, to hold those bones together so that they can heal. He will not be able to place weight on that foot, okay. So it, it's kind of a strange picture here, but direct healing is when you would actually put in screws, okay, into the bone two sides of the bone that are fractured. And then from the outside, we're gonna pull these guys together, okay? And I'll show you a better picture in a minute. But we're basically doing the work for the body that it cannot do on its own by placing the force of pushing the bones together so they can do their thing. All right, so this is a better picture. Um, Internal fixation and external fixation. So for my brother, internal fixation was enough. They were able to um, put enough pressure from the inside with plates and screws and stuff. But a lot of times with big bones and really bad fractures, check out what needs to happen. They have screws through the bone pieces, and from the outside, they connect to those screws and actually create this force. So they're pushing all of the bones the right direction so that they are aligned perfectly and they can heal over, okay? So as, as barbaric as this looks, it's actually quite efficient. Um, but you can certainly imagine the nursing diagnosis you would consider for this patient, right? A patient who has this for who knows how long. I mean, it could be a very long time. Um, they have risk for infection, right, more so than another patient with all the open areas. Pain. They have to look at this over and over again, and these get adjusted, okay? These get adjusted, tightened, uh, eventually do have to be removed. So there's a lot of um, kind of barbaric fear that goes with seeing this, this contraption. It kind of looks like a torture device, okay? So part of our job is to reassure the patient 
if you're interested in working in ortho, you're going to see that a lot. There are things that can go wrong, okay, as we've talked about when we reduce things, okay, bones not coming back together, bones forming incorrectly, um, or taking too long. Okay, so now we're moving on to a new idea, um, which is so much fun for me. So a dislocation versus a subluxation. So a subluxation, you may have heard that word if you've ever been to a chiropractor, they talk about a lot of subluxations in the spine that they're correcting. Okay, Dislocation is a bit bigger of a deal, um, although it's the same concept. The only difference is that a dislocation is a total loss of contact between the two joining surfaces, so the two articular cartilage surfaces. A subluxation is only partially lost contact versus total loss. So this is the glenohumeral joint, right, which you guys know, um, <clears throat> in the shoulder. Okay, it's clavicle. And this is probably the most common place that you're going to see a dislocation. And you can see it happening. There's two ways that this joint tends to be dislocated, as you can see. Um, depends on how the injury happens. They're both considered dislocations if there's total loss of contact between this area and this area. Okay. And what do you think is the danger? Okay, so clearly you know, you've known people who have dislocated their shoulder and they pop it back into place or, or whatever, right? But what do you think is the biggest danger of this happening? Think about what's happening to all the other vessels, to all of the nerves, to, to ligaments, to the soft tissue, everything, okay? So the big risk is that you're going to actually t uh, damage the nerve vessels and the blood vessels. If you cut off blood vessels because, let's say, this drops down, Okay, cuts off blood flow. What could happen? You could actually get ischemia, necrosis, and you could get permanent disability in that shoulder due to um, tissue dying, cells dying around the joint. Um, the other thing you could do is you could do damage to the nerve vessels that are in the area. So it totally depends on how it happens, where it happens, and what happens as a result. So it's always best to advise people to go in and get it um, placed back by somebody who knows what they're doing, okay, by a professional provider of some kind who's been trained versus doing it by yourself. And that's the reason why. It's because we want to ensure that the bone is, you know, back in place. They'll take an x-ray <coughs> before and after the um, the replacement of the joint. Okay. Now think about some of the other areas that you could potentially have a dislocation. What, what do you think is going to be most common for our patients that fall? So for them, they usually get hip dislocations. Okay. Um, hip dislocations require a considerable amount of trauma in a healthy individual. However, in an individual that is elderly, has bone loss, has osteoporosis, um, poor nutrition, etc. it's going to happen a little bit more easily. Okay, And one way that you can identify a, a hip fracture in a patient that's laying down on a gurney in the ER is you're actually going to see a difference in the length of their legs. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm talking about hip dislocation. I think I said fracture. Hip dislocation. Okay, You actually could see a difference in the length of the legs. Um, so there's an anterior and a posterior hip dislocation. So the anterior hip dislocation happens if you um, fall from an elevated height. So you can actually see this in actually all ages. Um, posterior hip dislocation you can see more from mo motor vehicle accidents and things when you're looking at the regular uh, population. Okay. Now, shoulder dislocations common, elbow dislocations, 
very common in little people. Uh, wrist, finger, hip, and hip uh, dislocations happen often in the younger population due to football, rugby, and basketball. Knee dislocations um, can also happen if you're if they're doing a lot of weight bearing um, sports as well. Okay, so those are just some of the more common ones the book mentions. So this is kind of a classic view on a shoulder dislocation. So you can see the clavicle here. Okay, now normally you would have a bone, which would be what bone? The humerus, right? So the humerus is here. Normally the humerus would be up here connected and with it, believe it or not, we're pulling up muscle. Okay, muscle, which would make this nice and round here. But like this beautiful side over here, okay? So, but because the humerus is now down here and gravity is pulling it, okay, you're just seeing the end of this bone structure, the beginning of the glenohumeral joint here. Okay, so that's kind of what it looks like. It's just kind of interesting. <clears throat> okay, so now I want you to stop for a second. If you are with other people, I want you to pause the video and I want you to touch the other person's patella. Okay, I want them to be completely relaxed. I want you to see if you can move the patella around. Find it and move it around because it can be, it's usually mobile to an extent, okay? Ask the person that you're with if they've actually ever had a dislocated or subluxated patella before so that you're aware of it, okay? This is a picture of a patellar subluxation. So if you can remember, that's only partial loss of contact between the surfaces, right? <clears throat> Okay, so surprisingly more common than you would think. I've, I've heard stories of it happening to people just climbing on their hands and knees onto a truck or something like that. Um, so, pretty cool. All right, tendons versus ligaments. So we're moving forward now. You have to know the difference forever and ever, okay? Ligaments are always going to be bone to bone. They're always bone to bone. Okay, tendons are always muscle to bone. Okay, now if you have trouble remembering that, think about the Achilles tendon. Okay, think about what would happen if your Achilles tendon ruptured. Okay, what would happen to it? If your Achilles tendon ruptured, what would it look like? Have you ever seen a patient with that? Okay, so basically, if it gets ruptured, the tendon connecting to the muscle and then the whole calf muscle balls up, okay, shoots up your in your calf and you get this little ball in your calf and it's your entire calf muscle, the gastrocnemius, okay, because the, the tendon no longer is holding it down to your heel, okay. So that's kind of a good way, I think, a good visual to remember Achilles tendon is connected to your calf muscle. And you will see patients who have had this happen Sometimes it's very painful and sometimes it's not. And it can happen from simple things like stepping off the curb wrong. Um, it's quite odd, okay? But ligaments are going to be bone to bone only. So both tendons and ligaments are have collagen and fibroblasts and they give a very strong elastic quality. Ligaments actually, ligament fibers actually have more elastin um, than tendon fibers, which I thought was kind of interesting. They also facilitate movement and they limit movement. Okay, so don't forget how important it is for us to be able to stop moving. So I'm talking with my hands right now, and I have to be able to stop my arms at some point from moving forward so I don't hit my computer, okay? And we have to stop ourselves from walking into the street and getting hit by a car. Um, so all of you know, forward movement and the stopping of movement are just as important. Tendons and ligaments really help make that happen. It's a big part of their role. <clears throat> so 
So certain words that you hear a lot dropped in the orthopedic world, strain, sprain, avulsion, okay? Avulsion is kind of like the example I gave you of the Achilles tendon being ruptured and going straight up. Sprain is ligament injury, not tendon, okay? So when you think about the last time you sprained your ankle, okay, sprain your ankle, you actually hurt the ligaments, not the tendons, okay? There are tons of these teeny tiny ligaments in your foot, around your ankle. Um, I have sprained my ankle more times than I would even admit, okay? I have to tape my ankles before every soccer game. And any of you who have sprained an ankle, you know, once you sprain it once, you are highly um, likely to do it again. And the reason is, once you overstretch those ligaments, remember they have elastin. Remember, you over, if you overstretch them, they become permanently overstretched. And the only way to get them back to normal is if you did surgery, which most of the times it's not worth the risk of the surgery. Um, so, ankle sprain, ligament damage, okay? Um, for strains to the tendons, the hands, feet, knee, the upper arm, biceps and triceps mainly, um, the Achilles tendon and the thighs and the quadriceps tendon tend to be more common, more sports injury related. Okay. And actually, before we move on, um, one more question for you. The most common ankle sprains, are they normally inversion sprains or eversion sprains? You guys remember that from health assessment. So is it an inversion or an eversion? So move your ankle around and think about it. Which would be much more likely to happen? Okay. And actually the inversion sprains are very common. Eversion, highly rare. Okay, now we're moving on to diseases, problems with the tendons. So inflammation of a tendon is very different from degradation of collagen fibers within the tendon. So make sure you do not confuse the two. Okay, furthermore, in order to understand how a tendon can get inflamed. Um, I want you to consider that there are these things called epicondyles, okay? There are these bony structures that come off of major joints um, <clears throat> that the tendons actually connect to or attach to, okay? Now, depending on, and you can see the, the attachment here, Okay, now depending on whether it's a lateral epicondyle or a medial epicondyle, you could have a different um, causing uh, causative movement. And I'll show you the difference. Okay, so look at this guy and kind of imagine what he's doing. Okay, that, particularly this move. Look at the move he's doing. He's swinging outward. Okay, and you can actually make that movement with the tennis racket. So what's getting the strain, the lateral epicondyle or the medial? Okay, actually it's the lateral, and you probably got that. Um, this is classic tennis elbow. It's lateral epicondylitis, and it's, it's an irritation and overstretch um, of what's called the ECRB tendon which is the extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon, okay? I'm more interested that you know that it's the lateral epicondyle that that tendon is linked to. On the flip side, this was my, I believe this was Tiger Woods. Um, this is going to be golfer's elbow, okay? So you're looking at the medial epicondyle um, having... Uh, inflammation at this point. Okay, forearm flexion and pronation are the are the number one causes for this, and it's classically golfer's elbow. 
Now, a little research question for you. Do we have a good replacement for tendons and ligaments at this point in our research and in surgeries? The answer is no. Um, I wish that we could say that we did. Uh, but And we do have some great things for the future that we're hoping will be very equivalent um, to the material that our body naturally synthesizes for tendons and ligaments. But the point is, all this time that we've been researching for athletes and trying to help replace these things that get injured so easily, we don't yet have the ability to synthesize it. Um, our, our body is so complex and intricate that we can't figure out a recipe to replace these things. They will not function the way that we were made naturally. So, so please do not take for granted any of your tendons, your ligaments, your bones. Anything that we've learned about so far, um, they're all just so unique and, and so difficult to replace even to this day. Okay, bursas. Bursas are so neat. They're like these little pillows that surround all of our major joints. <clears throat> um, and they provide cushioning. Okay, so they're little cushions or little pillows where skin, muscles, tendons, and ligaments are going to rub over bones. Okay, so you can find them all over the place. Now, the question is, are they normally inside the joint or outside the joint? And the answer is, they are normally outside the joint. You can see some bursas on this picture as well. Okay, but they are outside the joint. They're these little pillows. Okay, and they're giving, again, cushioning here, okay, because of where everything is located and the amount of pressure that's normally there. Um, synovial fluid is a little different, okay. Synovial fluid we'll see um, in another picture, but it's plasma, superfiltrated plasma from the blood vessels that lubricates and nourishes the cartilage pads. It covers the end of the bone. Now, bursitis, see it all the time in urgent care. Um, you very well may see it at some point. As you can see, do you think that this is inside the joint or outside the joint based on this, just the appearance? It's actually outside the joint, right? So this is a bursa outside. If it was inside the joint, we wouldn't have this swelling on the outside. It would be in here and it would be very painful for this person to <clears throat> flex and extend the elbow. Okay, because the problem would be inside. But actually the bursa on the outside, while it's painful to touch and painful if he were to lay his arm down on something, it's not nearly as serious as a problem inside the joint. And it will go away with rest, uh, anti-inflammatories and um, most people don't want to do that, but that's actually how you cure it, assuming that there's no further infection. Um, some of you may say, well, can't you just drain it, right? Like, can't you just stick a needle in there and drain it? And the answer is no. Um, the fluid that fills in the bursa sacs during a bursitis is so thick you actually can't drain it. Um, so it's not even worth uh, doing it will get reabsorbed by the body. You just need to give it the time. Now, septic bursitis is when you have a wound infection, and then secondarily get an infection of bacteria inside the bursa, and that's a different story that requires antibiotics and things. <clears throat> okay. Now, knee bursitis can happen from climbing stairs repeatedly, crossing your legs repeatedly. Okay, so another reason not to cross your legs. Um, shoulder bursitis tends to be from a repeated arm abduction. Okay, so imagine abduction as opposed to adduction. Okay, so repeated abduction. So it's mostly repeated movements. Okay, and now we are moving on into muscles. And you can see this beautiful picture. I just 
really enjoy it of the different muscles in the body. They're so intricate and complex. And I want you to consider there are three uh, major groups of what make up our muscles, okay, components of our muscles. Water comprises 75% of our muscles. 75% is water. And yet we go out and we work out or we do a long walk or, you know, whatever. And then we expect ourselves to magically be totally fine. But we haven't had enough water, okay? That's why water is so important. It's not just for your cells to function, your white blood cells and your, you know, your blood and everything. It's also like your muscles, okay? 75% water. 20% is... Who knows? Protein. Okay, protein, protein, protein. And I know you guys know that by now. Protein is very important to muscle rebuilding and muscle maintenance. Okay, you probably know a lot of people, or perhaps you're one of them, that actually does protein supplements if you're trying to gain new muscle or hypertrophied muscles. Okay, 5% is um, kind of a miscellaneous, um, different compounds, <clears throat> but only about 5%, okay? Now, some news, I wouldn't say it's good news, but between the ages of 30 to 60 years old, our muscle mass decreases by about half a pound each year. And for each half a pound lost, we gain a pound of fat. Okay, <laughs> so now that is assuming you do nothing to change your life and you just continue moving forward with everything. Okay, that's an average. That does not need to be you. And if you start making um, healthy, physical, and nutritional choices now um, and continue that throughout your lifetime, this will not be you. We have over 600 muscles in the body. And each muscle is actually considered a separate organ, and it's encased in what's called fascia or fascia, however you want to um, pronounce it. Fascia is connective tissue. It helps protect the muscle. Um, it also helps attach the muscle to the bone, and it provides structure. Okay? There's nerve fibers in here, there's blood vessels, and there's lymphatic channels. Consider this, that muscle fibers are tearing as a result of overstretching. And that's what's considered a strain, <clears throat> muscle strain. So how can, how can you take this and apply it to your life? I want you to think about the last time you worked out in any way. If you did a yoga class, okay? Did your yoga class, did your instructor warm you up appropriately before you started um, deeply stretching. Okay, if not, you need to go to a different class because it's unsafe. Okay, um, a good track coach will tell you before you actually do your track workout, you warm up by jogging a mile, just a warm up of a mile. Okay, and that is to keep you nice and warm and prevent you from overstretching in your massive workouts when you start elongating your stride and and all of that. Okay, that means that you can't just go out after not working out for, you know, an entire semester and decide, you know what, I'm, I'm going to make up for all the days I didn't work out today, and I'm going to play tennis for four hours. <laughs> so it's very tempting, and we've all been there, um, but you're going to get muscle strain. You're going to tear things. <clears throat> Could be lots of micro tears, but it's very painful, okay, and you're going to suffer for a while afterwards. You have to warm yourself up, you have to keep yourself warm, then you do your workout, and then you cool down slowly and let your heart get back to normal. Okay, We have to teach our patients the same thing. We can't have them think that they need to go out and do ridiculous things by themselves and hurt themselves. Okay, um, Muscle cells, can they regenerate? That's my question to you. 
And yes, they can on their own, but takes usually up to six weeks. Okay. Um, our younger generation is more likely to have a muscle rupture. The older generation is more likely to have a tendon rupture. That's kind of just interesting. Um, treatment for muscle strains you can see in the notes, but um, rest in ice for the first few days. Okay, the ice brings down inflammation. We only use heat if the area is no longer inflamed. Heat brings blood flow, which is fine if there's no direct inflammation. Okay, a directly inflamed joint you're never going to add heat to um, that can make it much worse. Ice should never be used for more than 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, reason being um, blood flow needs to return to that area. <clears throat> and if you keep the ice on for longer than that, the body will compensate by sending way too much um, fluid to the area and make it swell even more. Okay, so we're finishing up. Um, today's talk with rhabdomyolysis. So you're actually having a group presentation on this, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, compartment syndrome is usually on NCLEX, as can be rhabdomyolysis. So, so please be very familiar with these. And I'm actually going to um, test you on the next page and see how you do with a typical, rather challenging NCLEX question. So the nurse has conducted teaching with a client in an arm cast about the signs and symptoms of, of compartment syndrome. The nurse determines that the client understands the information if the client states that he or she should report which early symptom of compartment syndrome. So first, you have a lot of words there, and you need to find out what is most important about this question? What in the world do they actually want to know from me? Okay, so we know that the patient is in an arm cast. Okay, very typical cause. Um, well, not it's not common, but it yes, it can definitely cause compartment syndrome. Okay, you then need to know something about compartment syndrome. And you need to find out what's true, right? She should report which early symptom. So this word early is key to answering the question correctly. Because most likely they're going to give you a bunch of good answers and you have to pick the best of the best, right? So take a look at it for a second and tell me what you think the answer is. For the early symptom. All right, so the answer is B, numbness and tingling in the fingers. Now, don't feel bad if you didn't get that correct on this first try because most of the time, maybe about 2 out of 20 people will actually choose this one. Okay, so everything else is a later finding. Okay, cold bluish fingers. Of course, that's going to be late, right? We see the change in color late. That's like cyanosis. Pain that is out of proportion to the severity of the fracture <coughs> comes when the swelling starts increasing to the point beyond the numbness and tingling. Pain that increases when the arm is dependent. Dependent means it's hanging down from the body. Okay, it's an arm cast, yeah. Numbness and tingling is the first odd sensation, okay, when you're starting to have blood flow cut off. Um, we always look for, for this as an early finding, um, and we will continue to work with these questions. So hopefully you had a great time, and we will be able to do this again um, in our next lecture. All right. Take care and see you soon.